Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. So, a little bit of housekeeping tonight. Open the door here. We're done with, well, the 5U case right here. We're gonna ready to wheel that out. We're also done with 2115's old case. We're gonna do one final video on that tonight. I wanna show you guys what can happen if you uh, tow things incorrectly with a Caterpillar D2, but. All right, let's uh, find a place for you guys here. I'll just stick you right here. We'll go along for the right. Get the old 5U case wheeled out first. I don't think I opened the door far enough. We're getting it. So, boy, I love having these on wheels. Okay, that's as far as we need to go tonight. So, whew, close that door. It's kind of cold out in this part. We don't keep this part heated. So, boom, well, there we are. So, like I said, we're going to do a little bit of a look at 2115's old case, namely the, well, rather impressive bracing repairs that were done to this back in the day. I can speculate on how these happened. We're going to get into it, look at it, break it down, try and figure out how they repaired it. And I want to show you kind of a couple of interesting things on there to boot. So stay tuned. So I took some time the other day to perform the final cleaning and inspection on 1113's transmission case. And I'm happy to report that I did not find any damage or cracks anywhere. So I've mentioned before how you don't really want to pull off of either of the drawbar brackets that attach to these studs or that swing plate that goes between the brackets. You want to pull off of the actual drawbar only because the back ends of these cases are not structural. Even though there's a lot of material here, they are not meant to be a pull point. So I'm pretty sure that's what caused all of this damage on the back of 2115. You can see, well, first we take a look at it and we can tell we have this stud right here is bigger than the rest of them, okay? You can see, well, I'm betting they just drilled that out and tapped it for a larger one, but we have, if we can catch it in the light, a crack that comes off of it right here follows my finger down, I lose it about there. So we're still cracked on the case right there, even though they just kind of, I think, got by with sticking that larger stud in to remedy that. I don't know if the old one was pulled right out and I took the threads with it, I don't know, but they've also built up this entire corner all the way out here. They didn't have to go down into the gasket flange line, but they basically replaced all of that cast iron on this whole corner from there all the way out with brass. That's, <laughs> that's significant quite a piece was lost right there. And then they had to, of course, drill and tap and make that stud fit back in there again. This site is a bit more impressive because you can see not only do we have heavy, heavy weld here, it just about extends into this cavity where the bearing is on that uh, sprocket shaft, but goes all the way up through here, extends back out to the side. They took this whole corner of the case and separated it. That was... Uh, I'm surprised, honestly, that wasn't the end of this case. They put a lot of work into repairing it. And honestly, some would say this is ugly. I think they did a rather good job. So first off, we look at the width and consistency of that weld line. And judging by how wide that is, they almost assuredly V'd that out all the way through the thickness of this casting. We'll take a look on the inside if we can work the light right. So we have, you can see the fracture line. Oh, it extends all the way up here. And you can see some, some bleed through of the brass right there. So that tells me they were pretty much down to the bottom of it. That crack or the fracture extends back here. It goes through this boss. You can see a little bit more of the brass there and then quite a drip forming right there. So they had basically full depth right there. And then I'll work the light below the gusset. You see it makes the corner, comes back out, more brass bleeding through right there off the end of the screwdriver. And then that brings us basically out to this area right here. They did an excellent job of matching the threads in the brass here for this final drive housing um, hole. Filing stick into the screwdriver there. You can see it was all replaced. It's all brass out here. Probably a good eight or nine threads in, and then it turns into steel. But it's it's one pretty good interrupted thread in there. 
they did a fairly good job with that. And judging by, well, you can see I mentioned this cavity where that bearing is on that lower shaft. Judging by how far they went here, that thing just about cracked all the way into that cavity. If it would have made it into there, it's hard to say. They might have written it off or maybe not. This is an oil compartment right here, so that would have required that they got that sealed up very well. But I'll tell you what, looking at the whole thing, it's really interesting. Let's see if we can work the light right. These GoPros kind of get mad with this, uh, this incandescent light here, but I can tell you for sure they did not have this thing entirely disassembled when they did the repair because there is still evidence of heat damage in here. Like when we had the major casting on X231 repaired, they put that entire piece in a furnace and they pretty much got it all red hot. They performed the repair and then they did a controlled cool down over about a day or two days after that to make sure the stress is all equalized and it they weren't gonna just crack it again and cause more damage. But I know this one was never fully disassembled because well, back here, you can see it's very rusty brown. You can tell the heat from the repair burned all the original yellow coating out. You can see that that's what I'm talking about right there, like you can see on 11, 11 13. So it burned it all the way to this line here, but then you kind of have this reddish streak. That's right where it was enough to blister the paint, but it wasn't enough to burn it off. And then it turns into the original yellow again right here. So that kind of makes it a more even more impressive repair when you consider that because they had to do a lot of heat management back here to avoid making the problem worse and let's see if we can catch them in the glare oh these gopros or something okay you see all of those little they look like all kinds of little hash marks all the way through there i believe that was possibly some sort of chipping hammer because when you get cast iron hot you want to relieve stresses and stuff by just going tink, 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 tink all over. You can see them back here, you can see them over here, you can even see them, you see them on the other side. So evidence of, well, what was for sure a localized repair that, you know, in my mind, they, uh, they pulled off a heck of a feat right here by being able to repair that and not make it worse. So after the welding was done, we take another look at the back. You can see the machining lines that travel in an arc pattern through that weld, they are across the entire cast iron face of this transmission. They face milled this whole piece. I would have loved to have seen the setup that they put this in to make that perfectly flat back there again. I don't know that you can pick them up over here. You can hear them. Zink, zink, where the fingernail slides across. But usually if you're gonna do like well, mill a rather large surface depending on your machine. Sometimes you'll see like a swirl pattern that goes one way and then you can see where they made another pass back the other way. This one, well, you look at the lines and they form a perfect circular arc. So they had a, a machine that either went from the outside in or started at the inside and went out in one circular pattern to do all that. I, I'd love to have seen it. Um, Another interesting thing to look at right here. You can still see, I've never had the serial tag for the back of 2115, but you can see where they had stamped it into the case beneath the tag. There's an old rivet right there, another old rivet there. And I'll tell you what, I've got 2115's old engine tag that I rescued off the cracked block that's sitting over here. So this is exactly, if we line up those rivet holes there and there, that's exactly how that original tag would have been placed because Caterpillar stamped the serial numbers in the cases first and then they affixed the tags. That's one interesting uh, thing to note with these 1113 would be the same way. I'm sure if we peeled that tag off, you'd see 5J1113 stamped in the cast iron under that. But yeah, I don't know what happened to that tag. They, they might have just chiseled the rivets back in the day and discarded it before they milled it or they may have just let the milling machine take care of it they didn't take much off because you can still see that pretty well defined right there and that is the old caterpillar font so i know nobody came along behind and restamped it again but yeah the more you look at this thing the more it's just interesting because well it's interesting to me anyway being a person whose primary function in this world has been a fixer of things 
I just notice things like this a lot more than other people would because I just kind of try and think about the process that went into doing the repair. I wonder when it was done. I know it was done well before my grandfather got this machine in the early 80s, but even right down to, you can see the final pass here and you can see the way they did the arcing pattern and then came down in here and then that's where they ended right there. So that's kind of the signature of the the craftsman that repaired this. It's, uh, I don't know, I can just look at stuff like this all day. To me, to me, that's, it's kind of like, it's kind of art, kind of folk art, you know? Um, I don't know what I'm gonna do with this case. Well, I know I'm not gonna scrap it. We're definitely not getting rid of it. The problem is, it just looks like it's just begging to be used for something. Like, it, with these studs on the back and, it's got this nice stable bell housing flange on the front. It could just be like a perfect, you know, like like a grinder stand like that, but a lot cooler. It's just begging to be used for something. So we're definitely not scrapping it. This one's gonna stick around. I'd kind of like to even polish that a little bit and then just do a clear coat just to differentiate it. I don't know if I'd do yellow on the rest of it yet. I don't know. We're not getting rid of it anyhow, but I just wanted to show you guys this. To me, that's uh, that's a lot of history right there. I gotta wonder who did it. I have to wonder when it was done. I think I know why it was done. Like I said, pulling off of drawbar brackets that were never meant to be pulled off of, but just another instance of poor old 2115. She was damaged through and through. Something else to look at. I wonder how long that fender cross brace vibrated loose on there to wear those four grooves into the top of that case wallowed out those threaded holes stripped them out no threads left at all should be flat all the way across just like this lots and lots of hours <laughs> of loose and rattling equipment let me tell you So we've got both the surplus cases out of the shop. We'll probably get those hauled out sometime tomorrow, maybe when the sun's out. <laughs> it would be a lot easier to do it then. It's pretty dark outside right now, but that's about all I wanted to cover on 2115 for the video. It's kind of a shame that machine was so far gone. Not only were all the parts inside of it worn out, but all the parts that hold those parts were worn out. And a lot of memories in that old tractor, but you can't save them all. The best we can do is make others live on with some of the good pieces that were left. So thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for sticking with me. And quick before I let you go, I want to make you guys aware, as of the first of the year, I added a members page to the Squatch 253 channel. So if you aren't familiar with what that is, well, as channels grow, there's always notifications of more and more things that we can branch out into and try. And as time goes on, sometimes those notifications become more and more urgent. <laughs> so um, it's basically, well, I'll give you a little bit of backstory. I've had a few people inquiring about if I had like a Patreon account, if they wanted to help support the channel and the things that we do here. I kind of shy away from things like that because it's kind of an open-ended arrangement. I feel if someone wants to help support the channel, I at the very least owe them something in return. So. I decided to go with one of the options YouTube has been urging me to move into and that is opening a members page. So basically it's You'll see a new icon that appears down below the videos by the subscribe tab You can click on that take a look at it See if it's something you want to participate in if it is great if not great, you know, I'm not trying to sell you on anything I'm not a salesman anyway You guys are smart enough to take a look at something and know if it's something you want to participate in or not. So um Nothing here on the public channel is going to change. All the projects are staying just the way they are. They're staying available to everybody. And all the pertinent details of those projects are staying in the videos because I am really, really trying to leave like a video log of how I would go and fix like everything on a D2 or everything on a Super M on and on. So if it's not something you want to participate in, nothing's going to change on your end. Your viewing experience is going to be exactly as it's always been. If you do wish to become a member, um, 
standard template. Uh, YouTube provides what is called perks with uh, member packages. In my case, I thought it would be a perfect platform to throw up like some behind the scenes videos, give you an idea of, like what the rat race is between uploads because I handle, I address a lot of things prior to the video and then during the recording of the video. And it's pretty much never any rat race. So if you want an idea of kind of what it takes to throw videos up on a somewhat regular basis and handle everything in life that happens at the same time and also has to get done, that would be a place to find, like I said, some short behind the scenes stuff. We're not getting in depth like we do on the main ones, but it's something I can offer you guys in exchange for any support you lend the channel. So um, another thing to be aware, there is a community page in the member section to communicate back and forth, communicate with me, things like that. And no ads run on anything I put in the member section either. So that's kind of another benefit to that. So like I said, click the link or click the, the button. If it's something that you think you'd be interested in, try it out. If not, no problem. I don't expect anybody to have to do anything. So that's that. I wanted to guys make, I just about made it without messing up. I wanted to make you guys aware of some, one of the changes I implemented for the first of this year. We might be looking into some lines of merch next. They're always pushing us to do more and more. So basically it just means my plate gets a little more full, but I kind of enjoy what we do here. And I, I like the group of people that, that, you know, is the viewer base and we all seem to, to kind of be like-minded and get along. So as always, everybody, thanks for watching. Thanks for supporting the channel. Thanks for being here. And uh, we're ready to start throwing parts back on 1113's transmission. We're probably gonna be doing that next. So tune in for that.